Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Monkey Pie Quinn, D, 0, 7. Okay, well, let's, let's dodge back over to Robin again while I process this whole thing with McGann. So, Robin, of course, the most obvious thing about Robin, even from the very beginning, is, you know, what the name of the show is based on. Mm-hmm. Is uh, and we dove into this in our conversation at the coffee shop. This the the idea of his breaking down of language and exploration of language and how that informs him as a character to us. How mm-hmm. he informs us about who he is, as exactly. opposed to someone like Wally or Superboy or mm-hmm. Calder. Right? Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So if you look at the way that Dick uses wordplay, it shows that he has this level of awareness of the way that language is constructed and language is navigated in the way that meaning he's actually acknowledging in interesting ways that the meaning of words is on some level arbitrary because if there are these words like overwhelmed and underwhelmed but we don't have this idea of being whelmed at least in our common vernacular you have to understand that on some level the fact that we attach this over and under value to the idea of being whelmed is on some level arbitrary someone just said this is what this means right and everyone agreed to it right and so it shows on some level this tacit acknowledgement of that right it's actually interesting looking at his linguistic repertoire of languages that he does speak because the fact that he plays with words like this actually on some level might be indexing the extent to which he has been trained in the use of other languages because people who are bilingual do have sort of different relationships to language than people who aren't and so it draws or might draw certain attention to the way that thoughts are conveyed sentences are constructed and words are used right that could be theoretically impacted by the fact that he has all of these languages that he does know or is at least passively fluent in Right. And beyond that, it continues to index the idea that he's had this training with Batman and that training is about sort of lateral thinking. You solve the best cases, like all of the best detectives, including Batman, solve cases through essentially lateral thinking. It's thinking outside the box. It's knowing the rules so that you can break them and analyzing things. So it's indicating his training. It's indicating his intellect and curiosity. Yeah. And it's also indicating that he has this sort of almost like intuition that he relies on that pulls him to pick apart and then question other things like after he gets to a certain point. Right. And so all of his wordplay is in part to convey character and thought process. Yeah. But it's also to convey those important things to the people around him and to the viewer. Yeah. Where, sure, he's thinking these things, but why is he saying them? Right. It's interesting because in, I'm thinking of the scene in episode one where they figure out that these genomes are happening. I don't remember what floor. They were in like mm-hmm. halfway down or whatever. And they get into the elevator to theoretically leave to run away. Mm-hmm. And Robin has them going down. <laughs> right. And Kid Flash is all, dude, <laughs> out is up. And he's like, yeah. But Project KR and the answer to this mystery is down. And it was the idea that, yeah, there's no way he's not going to get all the data possible and follow the trail where it leads. I loved seeing that aspect of him and not being a jerk about it, just saying like, no, there's more here and we need to figure out what that is before we even know what's happening. We need need all the data. And... That's a kind of interesting because I think when combined with the wordplay that he does, it implies this thing about Dick where to him almost getting to the answer will allow for the backfill of some data where oh. jumping down and see what's going on there then allows for this kind of post facto or like after that you can fill in like the small stuff right connecting well, the dots exactly yeah and he's very aware of the small stuff obviously that's part of what the wordplay indicates about his character right but it also indicates that he'll jump to this sort of end point and then sort of play around with that from there and see how yeah. it might spiral backwards into what has happened or its implications beyond where it's at so like you're saying, it's it's this lateral instead of like linear thinking process, right? You take what you're looking at and look at it from any direction and every direction and pick up pick it apart. So not just, okay, I need clue A that leads me to clue B that leads me to clue C and then I'll have the answer. It's like, n- not necessarily. Like I could get clue C and then clue D. It doesn't have to be in chronological order. It doesn't exactly. have to be in any order. He can take them and play with them like a Rubik's Cube until he gets to... P 
piecing hopefully the answer to the mystery up. Right. And I think that that is interestingly contrasted with Wally, who I think is something more of a <laughs> mechanistic more thinker. <laughs> Mechaniz- linear mechanistic? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got an inventory background in certain ways where he recreated the experiment that Exactly. Caused Barry. Excellent point, right? And that's in this canon how the Kid Flash like became Kid Flash, and right. that's fascinating, right? So you're able to contrast that. I actually, unfortunately, didn't get to watch that much with Wally in it uh-huh. as I was going through and reviewing for this. But he does use a lot more. He uses differently casual language. He uses what I feel like people attribute slang value to. He says, "Dude." Yeah. And I could talk a long time about dude, but there's plenty of papers that analyze the sociolinguistic value of dude, and I say that they are very, very worthwhile reads. <laughs> Interesting. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but fascinated by that whole uh, idea. Yeah, a lot of it has to deal with what it does and doesn't index, but Wally is simultaneously casual and mechanistic, and Dick creates distance between those around him, especially early on, yeah. where he has been so hard-coded by Batman to... Always protect your secret identity. Yep. You never leave home without your utility belt. You always wear your sunglasses in the cave. Exactly. <laughs> and so he is visually creating distance right. in his portrayal of his identity. And then he is linguistically doing that by what he chooses to say and what he chooses not to say. For example, what he's planning to do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You guys weren't right behind me? Right. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, yeah, he's constructing and navigating his identity with all of these different people through the way that he is choosing to use or not use language. Right. I I just, I'm sorry, like my brain is processing all of the things that we're diving into. Uh, Yeah, I'm sorry if listeners, this is very, very (laughs) dense. (laughs) Feel free to pause and come back because that's what I'm doing and we're just going to cut my pauses out (laughs) while I try to understand all this amazing new info so let's let's switch over to superboy a little bit and yes. his downloaded languages there's two things about superboy when we were talking we discussed one was the fact that he just has i mean we don't know how many so theoretically every known world language mm-hmm. could be downloaded into his head and if that's the case like the fact that he knows them is one thing but the fact that he didn't learn them through an educational process Like, is there a difference between like, okay, I have worked four years to learn all of the intricacies and the trials and errors of learning Latin versus, okay, yeah, I can technically speak Latin. Is that like, is it the same as me using a translator on my phone to talk to somebody? And then second of all, I wanted to talk about, I don't know if it, I don't know if you call it a code switching, but Mm -hmm. in the episode with North and South Relasia having their conflict where he and McGann are in school while Calder and Roy are dealing with Lex the teacher snapper car asks about it and superboy rattles off this data and he but he mm-hmm. gets a very robotic voice that we don't really hear from him in in most of the rest of the series i don't think it happens again if i, if I remember correctly right doesn't. so but it tells us that he has a lot of data in his head that he can mm-hmm. access but is he constantly accessing it right does that so, all make sense yes so i'll speak to that part first actually and i'll say that i think maybe that there was a degree of changing register that you see happening there. Right. And there's also this idea in sociolinguistics of what is called marked speech. Okay. And what they were doing is by having him change his tone and speak in this very sort of rigid, formal, academic register, is they were marking his speech. They were making it seem abnormal to draw attention to it. Right. And in doing that, I actually think that you get some characterization here for Superboy, but they're actually also simultaneously characterizing and world building around project cadmus and project kr and all of the cloning they are using him to convey information and sort of associative detail about what they're doing yeah through that yeah so i talk a few times about our my what i call my holy trilogy the idea that when you have a scene the scene should do more than one thing Mm -hmm. you should move the plot forward give information, develop character. If you can do two or hopefully three, all three of those things Mm -hmm. in one scene, this scene gives, develops character and talks about him, but it literally gives information about the world at the same time it's happening. Yes. And in a way moves the, what you're saying is you've just plugged in the fact that it is a third thing, which is moves the plot forward because it isn't until the end of that episode where we realize that Lex and Raish have been working together Mm -hmm. to make this happen in the first place. So actually I thought that scene did two things, but I was wrong. It does all three of the things that it needs to do. And I didn't even know it. Yep. Super, super interesting. I love it. 
Wow. And <laughs> speaking to Superboy's, <laughs> his mastery of multiple languages, it's interesting because I think at the same time, it's doing that sort of world building about right. and conveying information about Cadmus. And you have to sort of break apart the difference between language acquisition versus language learning. Yeah. And right, exactly. He has acquired several languages, which language acquisition is a lot easier and a lot more authentic than language learning is because you reach something of like a critical period, I guess, in language acquisition around the time you hit puberty, like 12, 13, where suddenly you can't sort of passively absorb languages and it becomes right. this sort of effortful process by which you have to learn the languages. Right. And even when you're like really, really young, yeah. you start learning to distinguish and discriminate different sounds and then you don't learn to distinguish and discriminate other sounds on the basis of what you hear in language around you interesting there's like lr fusion that you sometimes see people talk about in certain a asian languages right where there's not the discrimination between the la and the ra sound right and there's a distinct phoneme that those languages use that actually exists kind of somewhere between the two right but it's not because they have a concept of L and R, and they are choosing to meet them in the middle. It's completely discrete and orthogonal. Right. And so chances are Superboy has this more sort of innate, nuanced understanding of the languages. But it also seems like, because it's hard to really understand the full implications of what being able to think and switch between that means, like on a practical level... Yeah. They're all functionally treated, I think, and this isn't necessarily a super great thing, but they're all on some level kind of treated as English wearing a different skin. Like right, yeah. his underlying thought processes and the way that he plays with language doesn't seem to be that much changed right. by the fact that he knows all these languages where you're able to pull out all of these really weird, interesting implications about Dick's thought process that could theoretically be nested in the language learning that he's done. Right, right. I just remembered in the comics as well to make another reference that Greg didn't happen to mention at the time. Maybe the comic hadn't come out, but there was a, one of the comics where Calder brings McGann and Connor to Atlantis. And of course, McGann is telepathically translating the language, mm -hmm. her language for herself and for the Atlanteans around her. But Connor just blatantly says, oh no, I can speak Atlantean. Mm -hmm. I, genomes programmed it into me. I right. Know it. Or like, I love the, I, I, sorry, just a bit of an aside. I love the idea that in this DC universe, you could literally just take high school Atlantean. Right. Right. Like, yeah. Theoretically, one of the largest countries on the planet. <laughs> like you could mm -hmm. just take high school Atlantean and that's a language and that's right. a thing. And they've taken time to make it a thing. But stepping back to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. that's where I was trying to figure out, like, it seems like that moment where he pulls out this North and South Relasia data, it's as if he's accessing a file mm -hmm. that he may or may not necessarily register or understand on a daily basis like yes. yesterday he probably didn't consciously understand north and south relasia mm -hmm. but if somebody asked him he could access it and i feel like yes. maybe his languages are the same and that they're not affecting his personality he just can use them as like a translator on like a google thing on my phone that i use to talk to people you know like right. i don't know how to say this in spanish so i'm going to do this and have the computer tell me right and it's hard to tell because we don't actually get a chance to see superboy in a whole bunch of sort of multilingual situations where right. we don't get as much of an opportunity to maybe tease that apart but i think that that could be sort of an implication where it's almost like uh, this might be a familiar phenomenon to listeners where sometimes you'll remember something and it's like oh yeah i like i remember that happened and then you think about it a little more yeah and then it seems a little bit sort of like the floodgates open up and then you remember a bunch of associated right. memories with right. that and i think that the relasia thing might kind of be like a super accelerated punched up form of that right. where he gets hit with it and then they mark it using his speech right and so he has this awareness but he doesn't necessarily have it in the same way yeah that someone like dick might have who's got this this body of knowledge with dick you can see how like his knowledge of french might have informed his learning of chinese in some mm -hmm. way or japanese how they would reflect you he'd be like oh this is like or unlike the other language i spent a long time learning exactly where superboy just has a file yes and it's funny because this is kind of maybe sound like a strange analogy but when uh, i first started dating my now wife i had this bizarre terror of ice skating 
So my wife took me to go teach mm-hmm. me how to ice skate properly. <laughs> and while I was ice skating, I was terrified of falling and it was affecting what I was doing. And, yeah. I, and I fell and it hurt. And I was like, man, I really wish I understood how to take a fall. Which, if you know me, is an absolutely absurd thought process to have because I've spent off and on 20 years studying Aikido, which is a martial art entirely involving yeah. falling. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, what? What? Like, I could hear the language in my own mind saying this thing to myself. And I was like, oh, why don't I just open that file? I was out of practice because I hadn't mm-hmm. trained in a while, but I was like, oh, wait, it really actually felt like I was opening a file and like, okay, now let's get that muscle memory back. Oh, suddenly I'm not scared anymore. Mm-hmm. Because part of that training training is learning how to not be scared to take a fall. Right. It was it was a completely absurd and ridiculous mental exercise that was happening with myself. And that's how I picture why Superboy may be less affected by this language that he knows, even though he knows them all. It's interesting, but d- does it affect him or not? It's so right. fascinating. And the same parallel to McGann's ability to translate mm-hmm. languages telepathically, right? Do you draw a so, parallel there? I actually think that it's interesting because I think that they're actually almost on opposite ends of spectrum interesting so i will say that i do think part of why superboy is so hard to unpack is because it's really really difficult for someone to understand maybe what it means to be able to speak every yeah language that might even be on earth or have historically been spoken on earth that we have right sufficient data on right in any sort of way other than statistically or numerically right whereas when you're dealing with a small handful of languages you might be able to see how see each how plays off the exactly. other exactly yeah yeah so it's almost like the quantity then gets in the way of understanding the implications right and then with mcgann and psychic translation it's almost like there's the implication there that you talked about like if there's like an idea that doesn't work in one language while she's doing this sort of psychic translation, it seems like intent, like communicative intent is what gets across. Right, like a concept, and then that concept gets automatically translated within the person's head to whatever the nearest concept is for their language. Exactly. Right, which I think is, for Earth languages, I feel is already intriguing, but then you end up taking them and putting them on RAN in season two. Right. And you have an completely alien set of frames of reference. Like, mm-hmm. funny, we have another Star Trek The Next Generation reference, but, you know, the uh, at Tanagra phrasing when Captain Picard is, is trapped on a planet with an alien and the alien is technically speaking English or the translator's doing English, mm-hmm. but he's speaking in metaphors the whole time. Right. That only makes sense to his own culture. So mm-hmm. uh, it's all I can think of. And of course, as is from a storytelling standpoint, you need to be able to tell the story that you're telling. So where yes. do you take that artistic license? How far do you take this concept before? Or the story you're trying to tell gets buried in verisimilitude instead of moving the plot right. forward. And so in a lot of ways, McGann's telepathy and in general translation and then psychic links and communication, it is sort of a convenience or a contrivance by which you're able to get people onto the same page. Right. Or you're able to essentially, in a more covert way, use walkie-talkies. Right. And then there's certain other cases where you do see it used as this private sort of channel of communication yeah, when yeah. other people are present yeah which I, I think of the scene where zatanna first gets introduced and she's all are you guys having a psychic conversation right now like she's watching their body language and mm-hmm. you can see her looking around the room as the team is doing this thing that you as a watcher is now completely used to because you've seen them do it yeah. but then you realize like oh well yeah they're doing it while batman and red tornado are standing in the room but yeah whatever but then you forget that zatanna's standing right there right and then she piece again just a reflection of showing that she's also a shocking like really smart strong character like all of them Mm -hmm. run at and she's like yeah i can't tell if that's super cool or really rude like right (laughs) which i imagine feeds into this idea you're talking about this power dynamic right so that's definitely a part of it where if you look at it for mcgann initially she's just like casually reaching out and doesn't realize that she is invading privacy right when she's doing this and doesn't understand sort of the implication that that has for people right in terms of crossing relational boundaries like i don't want you to know these things like get out right i get Um, to choose what exactly right and over time she sort of acclimates to that but then as they're communicating psychically more and more people are also sort of acclimating to this process but it's all operating very much like people either like sending like furtive small text messages to each other or speaking on walkie talkies while other people are present yeah and so it's essentially a a way for them sometimes in the way that you do see with multilingual code switching to Uh, index 
yeah. who is and is not essentially a member of the in-group. Yeah. Or it's an avenue by which they seek privacy. So in realizing that this is going on, Zatanna is keyed into the fact that she is not on the same relational level right. as the rest of them. And that in some ways her asking that is making an acknowledgement of it and then sort of asking to be informed on a more explicit basis yeah how where she does stand in the power dynamic yeah exactly that's really interesting because the, again speaking of the linguistics like re- relational linguistic when they're uh, on the bio ship and robin says you know i'm trying to be nonchalant about this and she mm-hmm. says mm-hmm. be as chalant as you want that just one scene between the two of them has so much information in it about who the personalities are again how her brain works which is similar in a way to his even though his is more grounded in reality or grounded in in technical normal physics and hers is grounded in different level of imaginative play and and also man of course i don't know how we can possibly have a conversation about language without talking about satana and her magic being words spoken backwards and i was going to say (laughs) that i actually i don't know how many languages satana speaks but the fact that she gets to the chalant might actually be a way to yeah index the way that she needs to be very very acutely aware of language and the way that it is structured so that she can flip it around and sort of on the fly right exactly. do spell casting backwards changes right. the way that she relates to words right. and their meanings I, I just realized that there are probably some some listeners out there who may or may not know this in netflix they kind of mess this up a little bit on the subtitles but if you're actually watching the subtitles on a lot of the episodes whoever's doing the subtitles understood that they are actually saying the sentences backwards so you will be able to see in the episode where the giant plants are attacking zatana or zatara i'm sorry says something like fire consume this plant abomination or something Mm -hmm. but if you look at the subtitles and you pause it you will see that he's literally saying that sentence backwards and in the comics it was a way to show this kind of interesting tweak of like what's happening and then once you kind of figured that out it was this fun little cryptic thing as a kid to read him backwards and figure out exactly what he was asking to be done Mm -hmm. now in some episodes whoever did the translations for the subtitles would say like speaks latin or speak yeah. foreign language. But in other episodes, they either had a copy of the script or they knew what was happening. Also, just a quick nod to the freaking actors. <laughs> yeah. Who managed to like make something that sounded fantastic out of those mangled backwards English words. Yep. You know, Amazing. It, I looking at them, it's like, hmm, how many takes would that take me? I know, exactly, right? And oh my God, a guy who does, I, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but the guy that does... Um, Zatara and of course Zatanna's a uh, voice actress uh, freaking phenomenal it's amazing. really really amazing. good yeah there's a couple more things I want to hit before we before we bow out one of them you had mentioned um, code switching with Jaime and the relationship with Ty earlier I just want to see if there was anything else that you wanted to kind of um, speak to about that and then yeah I, you covered it pretty good earlier but I want to make sure we cover that because I think it's pretty interesting because of the diversity of language and culture and characters and even sexes and social yeah. stru- structures in season two so i wasn't able to get as much into the dyad of jaime and ty as maybe i wanted to in the runaways episode because they are functioning as a group for most of that episode there's another episode in season two where you sort of get a look into their home situations right that i couldn't remember off the top of my head so i didn't watch it but i think that that's interesting Uh, sorry i just realized there's a couple of more star trek the next generation or Star Trek in general mm-hmm. connections because Robert Beltran actually does the voice of Ty's mom's boyfriend. He's the guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, of course, we have Marina Sirtis playing, you know, um, Queen Bee and some other characters as well. Mm-hmm. I just just a random thought process yeah. as I was replaying that episode in my head while you were talking. Mm-hmm. So Ty's, Ty's language and... Right, and so Jaime, like I said, I feel like in some cases they did manage to get this sort of... He sometimes uses it affiliatively with people, the code switching. Oftentimes with that sort of code switching, you're seeing it with two people who are equally fluent in both of the languages so that you are able to sort of conveniently midstream pick ideas that more adequately convey or index your intention. But he does that sometimes in order to close or create distance with people where... With the runaways, sometimes he's actively using, it seemed to me, whether or not this was intentional, what I picked up from it was he was sometimes using his Spanish, like switching, code switching, mid-sentence English to Spanish. He's actually indexing a mutual sense of minority amongst all of the people. Okay. Where in using... 
essentially the repertoire of things that Spanish indexes, he is creating a broader sense of community between himself and the other people with whom he's communicating. Yeah. And sort of pulling them in. So like we're all in this together. We're all sort of on the run. We're all. So he's creating this sort of mutual, broader minority identity that is then being indexed by his use of Spanish. Right. And I was actually interested in specifically looking at that episode where you get that deeper look at their home lives yeah. to see ways in which maybe that is or is not accurately the case. Interesting. And then sometimes, unfortunately, it does seem like they took a, a sentence and then just swapped in a couple Spanish words where it's hard to see what the communicative intent was. Right. Aside from communicating that maybe to the viewer, Jaime speaks Spanish. Right. I just realized this, though, that there is a period of time. I would like to correlate this, or if you go back and rewatch it again, let me know. There's a time, of course, where Green Beetle accesses Blue Beetle to theoretically free him, but mm -hmm. instead reactivates that beetle and, and mm -hmm. puts it under, puts it back on mode, right? After that, there's several episodes before you realize that Jaime is not able to control his own actions and that he's he's literally being puppeted by the Reach. And I'm wondering if some of those language slip-ups or weirdly placed things might be in a space or episodes in which Jaime is not actually in control of what he's saying. It, I don't know if that's the um, case, but I'm cu I'd be curious to go back and maybe. see. Maybe. I noticed some of it in episode one. Oh, pretty early on? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting, because that would have been an interesting idea or, or right. nod or, or question for the watcher if you and caught it, that something's right. weird and linguistically. Some of it, I think, in the first episode is them trying to just easily communicate and establish character. Right. Where right. Tim gives orders and then Jaime responds by code switching and then Lagoon Boy explains by essentially doing the same thing and using Atlantean, Atlantean slang. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. So I think there's about uh, maybe one or two more things we've gone on for in a long time. We this have. has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, one comment I just wanted to make, I don't think we need to dive into too much, but if, if you're from a writing standpoint, mm -hmm. the idea that language when you're writing dialogue for characters, when I'm, I've been in writing classes or talk to people or, you know, teaching writing classes as well, the idea that how to do dialogue is confusing to people and that their characters sometimes, they're, they have to constantly add character tags to their dialogue mm -hmm. because they're finding that people don't understand who's talk, speaking at a moment mm -hmm. or another moment. Right. So the idea that a language for a character should be personalized and independent. Now, in an animated series, you have some advantages because you've got a different sounding character, you have a different visual for yeah. the character as well so you know who's speaking but you know that if you took all of that away and put it in a not just a comic but if you put it in a novel you could have a full conversation between wally and dick and calder and connor and mcgann and artemis and you would know for the most part exactly who was saying what even though they're all speaking technically the same language yes exactly and I don't know if you want to dive into that a little bit, but it's an idea, it's a concept that blew my mind when I was learning about yeah. dialogue that, oh, you need to understand your character from the inside enough to not just throw in some language, just throw in some a unique catchphrase so people mm -hmm. know what's going on, because right. that gets annoying. But there is a different way that somebody speaks that informs who they are as a character, so you can read that on the page. Yeah, and I think that that's actually something that I think that from a writing perspective, you have to look at this combination of, at least I do now, where you're looking at sort of what is the character's background, because their background, their history informs their context right. and language and the what it is conveying is sort of contextually nested. So you look at the way that that plays into the context that a character's in, the way that yeah. it looks at and it reflects or is... Either the context that they have changes their interpretations of events or the present events change their interpretations of their context. Right. And that is going to change the ways in which people then choose to speak. And a lot of it's not super conscious, like people just tend to speak. Speaking seems almost natural. You aren't being right. effortful when you do most of your speech acts. Right, right. But at the same time, being aware that there is a context to which this is bound allows for you to understand that context also reaches backwards in time. Your experiences are a part of the context that you might drag with you from situation to situation. And memory is malleable. Exactly. Yeah. And so I can't speak to it on a super, super deep level or get into it maybe as much as I would 
like to, but I think that if you want distinct character voices, understanding their background and context allows for you to carry that forward through different situations where they're maybe navigating different power dynamics, right. where you will sometimes see people change the way they speak to people who are in higher stations than them, but they're still being very, very nonchalant or disrespectful or lax. Yeah. But you do see changes in the way that language is used because it's still needing to convey information and sometimes the respect is nested in there while simultaneously indicating a lack of respect or the difficulty of transitioning from being in many, many very rigid formal situations and then acclimating to how one speaks yeah. in less formal situations. So know your character and know your situations. Yeah. And I think that really, really strong, differentiated character voices will emerge from there. Absolutely. And I, I love this constant kind of bringing back to the relative power dynamic of the room that the character is standing in also kind of changes how I look at characters when I'm writing them as well. It's so interesting to me. Oh, yeah. Status is a huge part of good dialogue and good back and forth and good dynamic right. but we don't necessarily always recognize the way that it really really is encoded in our speech absolutely that's amazing so just to wrap up here is there anything else that you wanted to touch on or to add to the conversation this very amazing sorry <laughs> it lost all good words as my brain processes conversation i mean gosh i wish that i remembered the name of the article but if you really want to understand some interesting things about language and the way that sometimes we take things for granted, like slang, I could talk a lot about slang. There are some really, really good academic papers that have been written about the use of dude. If I can remember those, I will get them to <laughs> no, you. Please do. Uh, go ahead and send us. This episode will air a little ways out from mm -hmm. when we're recording it. So find those links. We will yep. put the links in the show notes and we'll put the links on the website as well. Awesome. First of all, I just want to say thanks. <laughs> thanks for joining us, spending some time with us in the cave, Quinn. Oh, yeah. Thank you for letting me <laughs> rant for an hour and a half into a whole, the ears of your listeners about whole, things that I'm sure they were very interested to hear. Yeah, oh, I I don't know. I was from many different perspectives. So where can people find you on Earth Prime if they want to pick your brain more? Oh, absolutely. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and my primary Twitter account is at monkeypiequinn. That is M-O-N-K-I-P-I-Q-U-I-N-N, -I -I -N, speaking of wordplay. And you can also find me on another Twitter account I have for my actual play podcast, which is called Swallows of the South, and our Twitter handle is at Swallows of South. Sometimes you might have the unfortunate circumstance of trying to communicate at me with at one of those accounts and then i will respond to you using another account because <laughs> i have no idea what that's like no with two accounts <laughs> um and you can also find me and my show at swallowsofthesouth.com i play around with a lot of cultural and linguistic stuff yes. in the course of the show because it's a framework that i kind of carry with me everywhere i go yes but if you want to get into a conversation with me twitter is the place to do it Absolutely. Thanks everyone for sharing time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. I encourage everyone to check out Swallows of the South. I randomly started with episode nine, and I remember having to pull the car over and sit in front of somebody whose house who probably thought I was a crazy person. Uh, because I could not focus on what I was doing because I was so emotionally taken away by what was going on in that, in that episode. That is, um, thank you. That's a very, very high form of compliment. <laughs> that was a, you know the episode I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, there was like in media res uh, a thing for me to walk into, but I immediately went back and listened to the three or four episodes right before that to find out what the context was of this crazy thing that was happening. It was Fantastic. And you can hear uh, Quinn's uh, amazing voice acting talents as well, which is pretty impressive. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also link over to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files on iTunes or your podcaster of choice and leave us a five-star rating. Ratings help us stay trot and, of course, help others to find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S., because we have to look a little harder to find those. Also, don't forget to hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix, or if you don't have access to Netflix, you can pick up the show on DVD or on digital through digital venues to support the show. You can also check out the associated comics at your friendly local comic shop or on Comixology and share Young Justice with a friend. And with that, stay whelmed, everyone. 
You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.